Very powerful stories, and you will hear more from that young man, Jamar Bright, coming up. Welcome, everyone, to a special Spectrum News Town Hall, North Carolina, Under the Gun. I'm Tim Boyd. Over the next hour, we will continue this conversation about gun violence, our gun culture, and if the two can coincide. We're going to hear from people who have lost loved ones to guns, like young Jamar, who's with us tonight. We're joined here on our new Charlotte studio with a full audience made up of people and organizations of both sides of the gun debate. They have come here with their questions. We've also assembled a panel of experts to make sure we have a balanced and real discussion about guns. You'll be hearing from North Carolina State House Representative Christy Clark, who's in her first term serving Mecklenburg County. Before that, she led North Carolina's Mom Demand Action a grassroots group looking for safety measures to prevent gun violence. Paul Vallone, the president of Grassroots North Carolina, it is a self-described no compromise gun rights organization to defend the individual right to keep and bear arms. South Carolina State House Representative John King, you heard him in that documentary. He has served York County for 11 years now. And Mecklenburg County Sheriff Gary McFadden, last fall he was first sworn in as sheriff, but before that he was a homicide detective with Charlotte Mecklenburg Police for more than 20 years. Before we get to the questions, let's take a look at some of the numbers here in North Carolina. Nearly three out of every 10 people own a gun. This year, the city of Charlotte has been a hotbed for violence, currently on pace for 132 homicides. Last year, the Queen City had a 57 homicides. Durham also with a very violent start of the year. Through the first three months, the Bull City has had 14 homicides. Last year, they had 32 for the entire year. We're going to talk about policy over the next hour, uh, and I was going to start with a policy question, but I'm going to throw an audible right at the top here because of what we just saw lots of emotions, obviously these families going through a lot. How do we stop the pain that these families are going through, some that are here tonight, but also not infringe on the Second Amendment rights? Mr. Vallone, we'll start with you. Well, thank you very much, sir. <clears throat> I think one cannot help but feel for the victims and their families in that documentary. And I truly hope that they find and we help them uh, succeed in finding more love in the world. And I think we all agree that we should formulate public policy which will effectively save lives. Now, that is exactly what we have been doing since 1995 when we passed North Carolina's shall issue concealed handgun law in order to deter murder, rape, and aggravated assault as these laws have been found by controlled multivariate research in other states to do. Unfortunately, there are some some false perceptions. Uh, for example, I was told that I was here to talk about the recent rise in gun violence in North Carolina. Um, as a matter of fact, the Charlotte Observer recently said, as more people carry guns, there inevitably will be a rise in the number of people who use that gun in some sort of altercation. Unfortunately, those things are not true. Could we see my first slide, please? Um, if we look at slide number one, um, I'm not seeing my slide. That's good. They'll put it up okay. here in a second. Go ahead. All right. If we look at slide number one. It's up now. Oh, good. It charts the, oh, there it is, okay, the total violent crime rate per 100,000 people plotted against the number of concealed handgun permits issued since the law's inception in 1995. What you see is that crime began to spike shortly before inception of the law and has been dropping ever since. Both, as a matter of fact, total violent crime rate and also, if you look at the second slide, murder dropped similarly. Uh, as well as corresponding drops in rape, uh, aggravated assault, and robbery. In fact, since we passed concealed carry in 1995, violent crime has plummeted by 42% in the state of North Carolina, and murder has also dropped by 42%. So we look for effective laws that actually create uh, that actually save lives, and that is what we have been doing. Um, and in fact, you may see a little spike in 2015 and 2016, which I will be happy to discuss shortly. There is we'll, a reason we'll, for we'll that. We'll continue into this. Re mm -hmm. Representative Clark, I want to start with you. Uh, just an easy question. Are you, are you buying, buying what Mr. Vallone is selling? You know, I really do support his position that strong gun laws will be what keeps us safe in our communities, and the background check 
process that goes along with the concealed carry permit is an excellent process in North Carolina. We're one of the few states that have that, and that is one of the things that keep us safe. But it's also true in this state that you don't you can also buy a long rifle or a long gun without a background check if you do it online or at a gun show, you know, from a private seller. And so we are when we're talking about this, we have to look at the whole picture and remember that every sale of a gun in the state does not always have a background check and that does not keep us safe. Sheriff, back to the, the, the top of the question, from, from your perspective from law enforcement, how, how do we stop these tragedies from happening but not, not uh, stop or infringe on the Second Amendment rights of people uh, across North Carolina? We should be talking about conflict resolution. Uh, we were still going to own guns. People have the right to bear arms. Uh, I think a lot of it comes from conflicts that we have in the community, in the homes, in the schools. Uh, I think that's one way that we can reduce gun violence. And then we can talk about gun safety. When we talk about gun violence, we're also talking about uh, the guns inside the homes, whether they're in a the safe, whether they have locks on them, uh, and how we treat guns and how we teach our kids um, for gun safety. I don't think we do a very good job of that. Uh, then we also have to talk about uh, where we store our guns. Um, at any given time, um, down at a Panthers game, there's probably 50 guns in the parking lot. And it's very easy to find those guns because most of the time they have an NRA sticker on it or they say protected by Smith & Weston. And people are going to break in those vehicles and uh, remove those guns. And we know that very well because larceny from autos are up. And the reason why, because people leave their guns under the seat or in the glove compartment. And if they're, if they're in a pickup truck, um, you don't really have a storage area like your trunk. So people are going to break into cars and, and steal the guns. Want to jump in here? Sure. I would um, say that as a state representative, I believe that the state and the federal government has to do better in working together and hand in hand and ensuring that um, people who are dangerous um, are identified and not allowed to um, purchase guns. And what I mean by that, just like what we had found in York, South Carolina, down in York County in Fort Mill, here you have a, a young man who is mentally ill who goes in and just check a box instead of having some type of background check that doesn't allow someone just to purchase a gun one day and receive it the same day. So I think we have to work together as a state and, and, and with the federal government to ensure that these people are identified. I, I want to go back now to the, to the Second Amendment itself, and I want to read it. It's 27 words. A, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And what I want to ask is, to me, a lot of this debate boils down to this amendment and how you interpret it. This, the Supreme Court has interpreted over years, but are there limits to the Second Amendment and what they, should they be? Mr. Villon. Well, I think the uh, Supreme Court has so far laid out what limits there are to the uh, Second Amendment in uh, D.C. versus Heller and also in McDonald uh, versus Chicago. And to a certain extent, right here in North Carolina, in our case, Bateman versus Purdue, where we struck down the blanket ban on carrying arms outside the home during declared states of emergency. Uh, we struck it down in court on Second Amendment grounds, and uh, uh, the state chose not to appeal, so we went back and repealed the now unconstitutional constitutional ban on bearing arms. Um, are you good with where the, so do you believe the limits should be where it is now? Uh, I think there are some limits that I that should be lifted at this point in time. Uh, for things? example, uh, we have been advocating uh, bills to relieve uh, lawful citizens of the burden of having to obtain concealed handgun permits, providing they are qualified for those permits. And in fact, would, would allow them to carry concealed wherever they may currently carry openly, providing they are doing so for lawful purposes. Because what we invariably see is that the lawful citizens who will obey the law are not the people who are creating crimes and problems. You know, the people who are creating those problems will carry regardless of what the law may be. We'll get into some more of that. Representative Clark, where do you think the, the limit is when it comes to the uh, Second Amendment? You know, we have the right to bear arms in this country, and the Second Amendment is the law of the land, and that's something that we all respect and support. But we also have to remember that there are people who are a danger to themselves and to others, and we need to make sure that they don't have access to firearms. And one of the best ways that we can do that is to have a background check on the sale of all guns and also to pass laws like extreme risk protection orders that make it so that family and law enforcement can have those firearms removed from people when they're in crisis situation. Remember, that's temporarily and 
only for a short period of time while they can get the help they need. And there are steps like that, that we can take to save lives. You know, um, one thing is important to remember is that in states that have strong gun laws, they have fewer homicides, fewer law enforcement are shot and killed in the line of duty, there are fewer suicides, and even fewer women are killed as a result of domestic violence. And so when we're talking about what can we do about gun violence, we need to turn to states that have strong gun laws like Connecticut and make steps forward like that that can keep our community safe. And we are going to get more into these gun laws and whether they're effective or not here a little bit later. I should also mention that Representative Clark is in a Raleigh newsroom tonight, uh, practically fresh off the House floor. They had a lot of votes today, so we appreciate that. Uh, let's get to one of our first uh, audience questions here. It begins, as uh, Paul mentioned, actually, 2008, the U.S. Supreme Court's about assault weapons and large capacity magazines in the District of Columbia versus Heller. It was the first time the high court, in fact, had considered the uh, meaning of the Second Amendment in 70 years. It was a challenge to a D.C. law banning handgun possession and requiring firearms in the home be stored, unloaded, or bound by a locking device. Justice Anton Scalia, writing the majority opinion, noted, like most rights, the Second Amendment right is not unlimited. It is not a right to keep and carry any weapon whatsoever, in any manner whatsoever, and for whatever purpose. In 2017, the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals applied the Heller decision to uphold a law that banned assault-style weapons. The court saying whatever their other potential uses, including self-defense, the banned assault weapons are designed to kill or disable the enemy on the battlefield. Like I said, we want to put that into context for everybody a little bit before we go. So let's go to Jeremy Sugg now with North Carolinians Against Gun Violence with his question uh, tonight. Thank you. So uh, going to that 2017 case, would you agree that um, the Second Amendment does not prohibit North Carolina or South Carolina um, from passing a law such as that um, that was passed by Maryland that would ban uh, assault weapons and high capacity magazines. Do you want to direct that to anybody in particular first or? Uh, Mr. Villain. Uh, would be my pleasure. Uh, first off, the Supreme Court has never dealt with a case having to do with so-called assault weapons. Assault weapons are a name created by the gun control movement back in the 1980s, Josh Sugarman specifically, specifically for the purpose of confusing the public between fully automatic weapons or machine guns and semi-automatic weapons which function like any other hunting rifle and fire only one round per depression of the trigger. Okay, these are not assault rifles we are talking about. They are not military weapons. Those have been banned since 1934. In terms of whether or not North Carolina should ad adopt those things or whether or not it would be constitutional to do so, the constitutionality has yet to be tested, but I frankly doubt that it would be constitutional. In fact, in terms of the magazine ban, California, uh, just a, a federal judge just threw the, the uh, ban, the 10-round magazine uh, limit in California out the window right now, and that is currently under appeal. So the, the, the constitutionality would be highly suspect and frankly I had Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms agents tell me that the 10 years we had a ban on these uh, semi-automatic firearms, the, the 10 years it was in effect, it had absolutely no impact whatsoever on crime. Well let me say that a state can pass any law that they want to pass. It is left up to the Supreme Court to say that is unconstitutional. Now I believe that we do need a ban on assault weapons. I have supported that in South Carolina. I have supported um, bans on high magazines, as well as bump stop. That is something that I've supported in South Carolina, will continue to support, because that's what my citizens who elected me sent me down there to do. I campaigned on that, and they voted for me. To your question about can a state do it, um, any state in, in, in the United States can pass a law. And as I've said, it, it will be challenged in either the state or, or the federal um, Supreme Court and they will make those decisions as to whether, whether it's constitutional or not. Sheriff, do you have a take on this? Well, you know, I don't want to get into the law. <laughs> I, I think I'll stay away from the law part of it. I think that, you know, we can, and where my position is always here, um, is we can dance with the numbers, and we can dance with the facts, and we can dance with all these things, but the, the, the fact of the matter is that there are lives are being lost on the street every day because of violence and guns and we cannot find a remedy for it. And I think that, you know, this is a great start and we can talk about it. But, you know, it starts with the person, I believe, all the ways. You know, the person who owns the gun, the person who has the gun, the mindset, the, the mental um, stability of the person. Um, you can have 10 guns and never shoot someone, but then you can have one gun and then take out a whole classroom. So I think it goes back to how do we treat each other 
conflict resolution, whether we're mad, you know, whether the person has a mental disability, um, and all the laws that we're creating um, will be for the person who abides by the law, who's going to follow the law, who's going to do all the things to register uh, their gun. But then that's not going, no matter what law you change, it is not going to stop that guy from breaking in that car and getting that weapon and then going robbing a store or going killing his girlfriend or taking the uh, lives of students out of school. So, Sheriff, let me, let me ask you this related to what you're talking about, conflict resolution. So gun assault death rate in North Carolina is highest among males, 18 to 28. Are there programs in North Carolina? You know, when I was a kid, I remember DARE for drugs. There's anti-drunk driving messages in schools. Are there programs like that for youth in our state? Very little. Why? There, because we have, we're focused on bullying. We're focusing on everything else of what we uh, believe that the citizens of our cities and counties like to hear about. We, we talk about domestic violence, but part of that is, is about a gun. So let's talk about safety. Let's go to the schools. We know bullying, when that kid is bullied in school, he's coming back with a gun. And so we, we have to be uh, very mindful, no matter what laws we change, we are not helping um, our society to changing the way that we treat each other. Representative Clark, do we need to do something in our schools, perhaps, uh, in the future uh, to, to help deal with this issue? Absolutely. You know, um Sheriff McFadden has pointed out several times that something that's critical to the situation is the safe storage of firearms. When um, teenagers have access to firearms, it increases their opportunity to um, complete suicide or to take action against a peer due to bullying. And so we need to make sure that we're not only educating our students on how not to bully and how to respect each other, but also the parents and the adult gun owners to make sure that they're not giving access to our teens and young children um, to have access to firearms. And I just want to reiterate that if you have a firearm locked in your car to please lock your car because that's like the number one item that's sold out of a car followed closely behind a cell phone and those guns end up on the street and end up being sold as illegal firearms and used in crimes later. This is something our sheriffs and police chiefs will know and will reiterate over and over again. But taking steps in the schools to make sure that they just don't have access to a firearm is the best way to stop gun violence. Okay. Paul, I know you, you do NRA stuff with gun safety. I mean, is this something that you would get on board with? Well, I mean, it depends on, the devil's always in the details. We had a safe storage bill a number of years back which would have criminalized a gun owner if a gun was stolen from him and misused in a crime, even if he locked it up. So obviously we can't, uh, we can't say that uh, we couldn't possibly agree in a blanket fashion with any of that. I would, however, like to discuss uh, something about the extreme risk protection orders. Well, we're going to, uh, if I don't mind yes. to stop it, we're going to get into either, that a little either, later. Either now or later. In more detail. I would like but, to talk but what about I was asking House about Bill specifically, we'll get into that, I promise you. Uh, what I was asking though was more about the, the education and programs for youth and whatnot. Well, I mean, without a doubt, education is something that everybody values. I don't think anybody doubts that. In fact, the uh, organization that is routinely vilified by gun control advocates, the NRA, does more for safety education than any other organization in the world. And in fact, that they are principally responsible for the fact that the rate of gun accidents, both among adults and children, has plummeted over, over the last several decades. The NRA does more for gun safety in this world than any other organization bar none and unfortunately much of what passes for gun safety uh, being given to us by gun control advocates is is told by people who don't even understand which end spits out a bullet though the, what they call gun safety is in fact gun control that's what they're looking for gun safety is something that nobody absolutely nobody argues against Amen. Absolutely. I believe that an educational component is necessary. In South Carolina, I put up an amendment during the budget time that would have added a tax onto any gun that is sold in South Carolina to just do that, to educate people, to increase school resource officers in our school, to talk about mental illnesses in our school. Um, and so I know that there is a need for the educational component when dealing with gun violence in South Carolina. Okay, thank you, sir. All right, let's go back to the audience here. We have Scarlett with Moms to Demand Action. You can stand up with your question here. Uh, you have a question for the panel tonight. Kind of dovetails on what we were just talking about. So if we have a student that does bring a gun to a school, we hear that other states, they would, you know, maybe an elementary school student, they would be suspended. But what I'm not hearing about, again, is the gun safety or the punishment for the negligent parents. So just specifically, what are the laws in North Carolina and South Carolina if a student brings a firearm to a campus? Does it depend on the student's age and are parents being held accountable? Sheriff, can you tackle this? Well, I don't think we are, we are actually holding the parent accountable um, a lot of times. I don't know if that should be done or not. I, that's 
That's going to very much be debatable. Um, I think in Charlotte, we suspend a kid. Um, well, I think we expel the kid. Um, he's not in school anymore. And I think you have to look at the age. Um, Age does play a factor, but now we, we are hearing elementary kids are bringing guns to school. Um, they're finding guns in their home. It goes back to education. You know, daddy has a lot of guns, but, you know, he has the 25 in the dresser drawer that he keeps at night, and the kid is fascinated with it. He brings it to school, and all of a sudden, you know, we have an accident at school. So I think it's education. Uh, we, you know, we hear about these laws and all this stuff. Um, I had the luxury to interview uh, people who have killed people people who've taken people's lives or be in a room when someone's uh, take their own life with a gun or accidentally playing with the gun. And when you sit there and talk to them about it, I think you get a better understanding how easy it is um, to have the access to the gun. Um, and we, we, don't, we do not do a good job of telling our kids what to do when you find that gun, you know? Um, and it goes back whether you should have a gun loaded at home or not, if you have a gun loaded in the box and, um, you know, um, the safety is on or it is the lock is on. You know, some people said, I'm not going to have that gun. I'm, that gun is going to be loaded beside my nightstand. So I think all this is debatable of, of how we treat guns. Um, but we have a long way when we talk about gun violence in this city and this nation. Um, we don't address it enough. And like you said, there's, there's not that education component in the schools to talk about it. You know, we had the incident at Butler, um, and we believe that counselors are going to solve the problem. No, the community... Uh, it's going to solve the problem. All right, we got to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the red flag laws and others that are around there. Uh, but first, we want to take a moment to look at one of the darkest days in recent memory for North Carolina. We just passed that 10-year anniversary of the day. Our state joined so many other communities rocked by a mass shooting. Here's a look back at Carthage. March 29, 2009, just before 10 a.m. on a Sunday, 45-year-old Robert Stewart pulls into the parking lot of Pine Lake Health and Rehabilitation Retirement Home in Carthage, North Carolina. His estranged wife worked there as a nurse. He was armed with two pistols and a shotgun. He first opened fire on his wife's empty car, then shot the driver of another car before going inside. By the end of the day, Robert Stewart shot and killed eight people. The youngest victim was 38-year-old Jerry Avant, a Navy veteran who was a nurse at the home. He was shot 27 times trying to stop Stewart. Seven residents were killed in the shooting, including the oldest victim, 98-year-old Louise DeClerc. Carthage Police Corporal Justin Garner was face-to-face -face with Stewart in a hallway. Stewart shot Officer Garner in the leg, but not before the 25-year-old fired a shot striking Stewart in the chest. Eight dead, three wounded, the deadliest mass shooting in modern North Carolina history. Robert Stewart survived. In 2011, he was convicted on eight counts of secondary murder and given a maximum sentence of more than 179 years in prison. We gotta get these guns off the streets ourselves. You know what guns do. Guns kill. They are made to shoot you and kill you. Our laws must change. That is a given. I don't have a problem with people carrying guns. I want to be very clear about that. But I don't think that mentally ill people, I don't think people who are, you know, are going to go out and cause harm to someone because they can't think for themselves need to carry a gun. Welcome back to our special North Carolina Under the Gun Town Hall. Thanks for staying with us tonight. We should say, too, that we just got a report from the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police that while we were setting up here at 715 tonight, the city's 34th homicide took place this evening in the Charlotte area. Again, thanks for staying with us. Uh, you were in that last little bit there saying, you know, you don't you, you support people having their guns. I get this question from gun rights uh, folks all the time. You know, there are some bad actors out there. But why possibly infringe on the millions and millions of other people that are lawfully uh, having guns uh, in this country? Because there are people who are being killed. And if you are comfortable with carrying your gun and you're fine with um, having people to purchase guns, then you should be okay with background checks and precluding people with mental illnesses from having guns. Um, my brothers, my nephews, they are all um, gun-carrying people. However, um, I don't think that they would ever have a problem with saying, okay, send me through a background check before I purchase a gun. And so 
I don't have a problem with anyone carrying a gun as long as they are mentally competent and have gone through an extensive background check. Paul, do you believe that your Second Amendment right is in danger in this country? Um, I think yes. Uh, in fact, um, I think many of our rights are essentially one election away from being threatened. And I think the attempt to create a so-called universal background check system is in fact the attempt to create a universal gun registration system. And in fact, anybody who says that the national instant background check system cannot be used for gun registration should know that it already has been. When uh, Attorney General Janet Reno in the 1990s actually retained the transaction records in violation of the Brady Law and refused to expunge them in order to create a de facto gun registration system, which was in fact only reversed under Attorney General John Ashcroft during the Bush administration. So unfortunately, we have no problem with honest laws, but the, even honest laws can be manipulated to create something that, uh, that was not intended. All right, let's go back to the audience here. Uh, Paul mentioned that the uh, red flag laws, as they're known to, uh, you can have a, a stand up for us. Uh, tell us who you are and who you're with and uh, your question. Hi, I'm Elizabeth, and I'm with Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. Um, so what are the biggest obstacles for passing, um, it's HB 454, which is the red flag laws, and then should it pass, what kind of impact would it have here in North Carolina? Carolina, and what are the downsides, if any, to an extreme risk protection order? Representative Chrissy Clark and uh, Raleigh, uh, this would be a good one for you since you are a current state representative in North Carolina. What can you tell us? Yeah, and I'm also a sponsor of that bill, I'm proud to say so. Um, you know, the extreme risk protection order bill that we introduced um, is a step in the right direction into um, temporarily removing guns from people who are a danger to themselves or others. And you know what's blocking the passage of any gun law reform in this state is the gun lobby. Um, Paul Valone is a member of Grassroots North Carolina. They are our um, local gun lobby and then of course the NRA is the largest gun lobbying organization in the country and they are adamantly opposed to passing any kind of gun law that might save lives and so those are the big things that get in our way when we're trying to do things to save lives because it's critical to us when we talk about gun violence we have to remember that these are people that are dying there are people that are um, completing suicide with a gun there are students in classrooms being shot and killed there are our friends and family being shot um, as a part of a dispute between two people and it's time for us to take steps to do whatever we can to save lives and that is in part passing gun laws that will make it more difficult for them to have access to firearms and so when we talk about what's going to get in the way it's people that are opposed to any kind of gun law and i'm open to meeting with mr valone and talking about what we can do with this extreme risk protection order to make it more palatable for him because in my mind any step forward in passing a gun law in this state is a good step forward Mr. Vallone, what would make it more palatable? Well, first off, I should note that Grassroots North Carolina is an all-volunteer organization. We do not have lobbyists. We have grassroots activists, so we are not the gun lobby. Second of all, our, we are very much interested in saving lives. We just have a rather different opinion of how to do that than Representative Clark does. Now, with respect to House Bill 4, uh, 454, every... Nobody wants mentally ill people to have, uh, or, or unstable people to have access to firearms. Um, in fact, um, people adjudicated as a danger to self or others have been prohibited from owning firearms since 1968. <coughs> the problem is that we see people on the opposing side of this argument who are exploiting this issue to essentially incrementally restrict the private ownership of firearms. Uh, take House Bill 454, for example. This bill would allow nearly anyone, including someone you potentially took out casually for a cup of coffee at Starbucks, to get a judge to declare you dangerous and confiscate your firearms. And by the way, you do not get an opportunity to participate in the hearing uh, on, on which that is done because these uh, extreme risk protection orders are done in ex parte or emergency hearings where the defendant does not even get notice that the hearing is occurring, much less an opportunity to defend him or herself. Um, and what's more, because uh, it says a dating partner can determine this uh, and have you declared to be dangerous. Uh, it doesn't define what dating partner is, nor does it define what danger to self or others means. So these highly arbitrary uh, decisions could be made and, and essentially uh, deprive people of their rights. But the more important thing, I think, is that nowhere in the Constitution are you, uh, can you be deprived of a constitutional freedom without due process 
process of law. Therefore, these bills, by doing ex parte hearings, are in fact a constitutional violation of your Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments by not allowing you to participate in the hearing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go right back to Representative Clark since, uh, to, to respond to some of this. Th does he make some points? You know, um, I think he's intentionally being um, vague and to like make this bill sound more inflammatory than it is. Um, I know a lot of judges, I'm a paralegal, um, I work with them. I know that if you were had gone on a casual date with a person for one time and then you just decided to enact a streamer's protection order against that person that the judge would not have any participation in that, they would throw it out because that's not what this is for. This is for times where people are afraid for their lives and afraid for their family members. And if that is something that we can work to define in the bill that that's currently introduced. I'm open to that and I would love to meet with him to discuss it. I want to remind everyone that this is about saving lives. It really is. In states that have acted this and acted this law, it has made people safer in their schools and their homes. It has reduced suicides and has reduced domestic violence. You know, in North Carolina, we have a voluntary surrender order in terms of um, 50 orders in relation to domestic violence, and that is something that puts people at risk. You know, most gun violence. Um, and mass shootings happen as a result of domestic violence, like the story that was shown in the, before the commercial break. Um, that's domestic violence, and those are times where we need to intercede. And women are 500 times more likely to be shot and killed in this country and than they are in other developed countries, and passing a bill like this will save their lives. All right, let's go back to our audience here. Uh, Larry, if you want to stand up. Uh, Mr. Larry Hart, for those, uh, Hyatt, for those that don't know you across the state, tell us a little bit about yourself and your question. Well, my family owns the Hyatt Gun Shop, which is 60 years old this year, and I have seen a huge number of gun laws passed in my lifetime. And one of the questions was, what laws have really affected violent crime? After all those paperwork and all the permits and all the background checks and the concealed carry courses, uh, the credentials and what we put through people through to buy a gun, I would hope we have stopped something. Unfortunately, statistics aren't really showing that these things have a great effect because most of the criminals don't buy their gun from gun stores. Like the sheriff said, they steal in my cars. So we've done so much expensive, time-consuming paperwork and not done a whole lot with it. Probably the only statistic that we have is the one that uh, Mr. Ballone showed uh, with the concealed carry permit has showed some reduction in crime. The other issue, we don't really have a statistic that shows a crime that was stopped by someone with a gun. If a crime doesn't exist, doesn't happen, there's no statistic. So we're grossly underinformed about what effect gun ownership has in reducing crime. Uh, but like everyone here, we don't want the criminals or the mental patients to have them. And with the talking about the background check earlier, uh, we have seen some improvement in the information in the background check, there's more mental health information, more criminal information, and that system has progressively gotten better in the last 10 years. Mr. Hyatt, thank you very much. So the question was, what laws have actually prevented violent crime? Mr. Kim, we'll start with you. Well, obviously, um, that we need to do more. Um, I don't think it, um, one law that has passed um, is a, is a fix. I think it has to be a total reform of what we see as gun laws, especially in South Carolina. I've had two colleagues of mine to um, be killed, one in the Charleston um, massacre and one um, in Chester, South Carolina. I served on Chester City Council and Councilman Odell Williams was killed. I served in the House of Representatives for the last six terms and Clemente Pinckney, Senator Clement, Clemente Pinckney was killed. Um, there are things that we have to work on. I think what you find is watered down laws. If we were given a true opportunity to put and pass laws um, that are meaningful, then you will see a reduction. Um, I look at the, the young lady that was um, killed in Fort Mill, South Carolina. If we were able to have a law that says someone who's mentally ill cannot purchase a gun in South Carolina, which we have, but all you do is put a check mark and no background check or no record to show that this individual is mentally ill, then how do we stop it? And where does it start and where does it end? Sheriff, are our, our current gun laws preventing violent crime? Well, I mean, we could, again, I'm, I'm, I'm practical. 
We dance around with the numbers. We dance around with the language. We dance around with all of this. Uh, who says it is? I, I, we, we are here tonight because of all the laws on the books, but we're still talking about violence under the gun. We have to go back to what are we doing to prevent that? Um, I was surprised to see uh, Mr. Hyatt here, but you know, before I was elected, I actually went to his shop, but we talk about preventative measures. You know, we talk about him uh, selling a lock for a box so you won't steal it out of your truck. And you know, we can talk about this, but we have to be very mindful. It's the person who's pushing the trigger. It's the person who's uh, causing the violence. I go back to conflict resolution. But then we also talked about, and we kind of skipped over this thing about um, the mentally ill, um, the person who's dangerous. Um, should we allow them to have the guns? Should we take the guns from them? That'll be a yes in my book. Mm -hmm. You know, take them, and then if they do have to ex parte, you know, I'm not going to go with, you know, with the fancy words and the, uh, the, the legislation and all that. Take the guns away if he uh, proves himself to be stable then he should prove himself to a course to be stable, and we move on. Is it due but, process, though, like well, Mr. Nolan's worried about? Well, he shouldn't be worried about it, I don't think. I don't think he should be worried about due process. I, I think you should be very worried about it. Uh, I want uh, you and Representative Clark to consider Gary Willis, the 60-year-old 60 60 year Ferndale, Maryland man who answered an unexpected intrusion on his, at his door at 517 a.m. and was killed dead by police. Okay, serving one of these ex parte uh, uh, warrants. Uh, unaware, you know, he was unaware that any of this had occurred, and in fact, it was filed by a family member with a grudge. So the fact is, the standard of evidence is insufficient because it requires only a preponderance of evidence to issue one of these orders, which is a lack of due process. And frankly, I defy you to name any other constitutional freedom guaranteed by the Bill of Rights in which you can be denied without due process of law under the Fifth Amendment. And I can assure you, a hearing a month later after your guns have been taken from you, and by the way, under House Bill 454, the sheriff who confiscates those guns has no responsibility for what happens to the private property of the individual. So I defy, I defy you to find any other constitutional freedom which can be lifted from you without due process of law. No, what I'm saying is, is back to this. It's good that you mentioned this, but we can't say Ruby versus Glock and all this other stuff. We're, we're, we're getting to the weeds of semantics. What I'm saying is... Sir, my freedoms are not semantics. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying your freedom semantic. When, when they introduced me, they introduced me as a sheriff of Mecklenburg County. If you look back what they said, my past experience was not paperwork. It wasn't the numbers. It wasn't research. It is a homicide detective for 22 years. So when you're talking about guns and violence and murders and what people can and cannot do, I'm not going on a paper. I'm going on what a person has talked to me. Let me finish. I'm going on what a person has talked to me about. I, I respect what you're saying, mm -hmm. and you should respect what I'm saying. Oh, I, I'm, I deeply respect what you're saying. And in fact, in fact, you, uh, oh, that, that your experience... Sorry, sorry. Your experience is based on what you have seen with people, and I know a lot of police officers, right, but and I know what you've seen, but unfortunately it's kind of a skewed sample. No, I'm, I'm not saying that it's a skewed sample. If a person is mentally ill, would you want him to have the guns? <laughs> Obviously not. Okay. okay. If, 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 a, if a husband and a wife are having an argument, and she says, I'm in fear for my life, and my husband, we can so, see where he has been beating or an assault, would you want him to have the gun? Well, that's currently law and, no, no, okay, no. but the once question, again, under due is, process would of you law. Want him to, would, you, would you be willing for us to remove the guns? Or would, I, or would I be concerned that perhaps those accusations have been falsely made against him, as is quite often done? You're Actually, 32% of these extreme risk protection orders are rescinded by courts in Connecticut for being invalid. And if somebody makes an invalid complaint in North Carolina, the, under House Bill 454, the penalty is, is, is very minor. It's a misdemeanor. But what do you tell the 34 people who have lost their lives this year, Dan? Well, I'm not clear that 34 people have lost their lives due to extreme risk protection nope. orders. 34 people lost their lives to violence in this city. He just said that. Well, I'm not sure that this addresses that. That's what I you, would say. But to that is people. gun violence. And I'm not, it's not a Does argument. this address all gun violence? Is no. all gun violence the same? No, it's okay. not.
Thank you. It's not. In fact, it does include things like suicide, a lot of other things that are right. included in the statistics. Just, it's not a, a point for an argument. I'm just saying. Uh, unfortunately, what we see in the gun debate periodically is that gun control advocates lump together mixed intentionality, be it murder and suicide and, uh, uh, and accidents, in order to create a perception of gun violence, which is not actually true. And that's an article in the Charlotte Observer I was talking about, said, oh, we have this rate of 14 gun deaths per, uh, per 100,000 people in North Carolina. Well, that's false. Because because how do we get past all it's this only to, to stop it's, gun it's violence, half that. Okay, that, that's the question, right? How do we get past all of this to, to stop? Well, that's what I said. I'm not. I'm not, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not pointing no, this I, anybody. I agree, I'm I asking would, the, agree, the question out I, there. I would agree with them, but here's what I'm saying. I have to look at it from a point of violence. And and when you say what's your extent and, and the sheriff and all of that, I have looked at my past experience, which is is, is very extensive, on guns and guns violence. Yes, sir. Don't we have laws against violence against other people? Yes, sir. Yet we, the people keep breaking those laws every day. So adding another gun law, there's over over 33,000 gun laws in the books today that yeah. aren't being enforced. No, I'm not saying don't look at them or add. I'm not saying don't add them or add them. I'm saying we have to look at it from a different perspective. That's all. I'm not saying I'm not saying add, take away, or do all that. I, I'm looking at a perspective of. There are already laws against murder. It's in the Bible for starters. But there's laws against murder. There's laws against attacking somebody and hurting somebody. But now we're talking about adding more. Let's try to restrain this, restrain that. I mean, Representative Clark says she wants the red flag law come in. Well, let's put it in a proper perspective. I think that she, Ms. Clark, don't take this personally. I think you're driving very er er erratic. I think you're a danger to people on the road. Let's call the police and have your car took it away, and then you prove to the citizens that you can actually drive a car. That's what the red flag law is actually doing. And it's, uh, Representative Clark, I want to go to you next since, uh, to respond to that since he brought you up. You know, I uh, appreciate the frustration and the commitment to gun rights. I understand, you know, I grew up in a family of gun owners. My granddaddy taught me to shot a gun, shoot a gun in the backyard of his home when we were growing up. So I understand where they're coming from. But I also have, do have close relationships with people who have been directly impacted by gun violence, like um, Sharbin Kafadin has mentioned. Um, um, people who are relations to people who were killed in the AMU shooting, people who are relations to the victims of the Sandy Hook shooting, um, they are people that I call my friends, I call my family, and when I see in the hurt and pain and suffering in their lives, it is on me as a legislator to do what I can to keep them safe and keep from things like that from happening again. And I am completely open to modifying the bill that is the extremist protection order to make it be more amenable so that it's something that could pass. Because I do believe that in some form or another that passage of that bill will save lives. And you know, background checks are the number one thing that's been saving lives in this country. And I was just looking up the statistics and since 1994, 3.4 million background checks have been passed and have been denied by people who should not have had ownership of a gun. And so that's telling us that that kind of law works and save lives. And whatever it is that we can do, like the point of this all is to save lives, to keep our children safe at school. I'm a mom of five. So my kids are at school, they're in movie theaters, they're at concerts, they're at college, they're walking on the street, they're riding their bikes with their friends, they're out there in our community. And when I think about their lives, I wanna do everything to keep them safe, and not just them, but people who are also in other communities around my county. It's on me as a legislator to find that pathway, and I am open to doing that. And if we wanna have that discussion, we should have that discussion, because whatever we can do to save lives is what we should be doing. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we got to take one more break. Thank you for a, uh, a passionate but respectful discussion. We're going to continue more of that, including catching up with some of the folks that were in the documentary you saw just short a while ago. North Carolina Under the Gun continues after this break. A gun is a gun. It's gonna do what it's meant to do. It's gonna kill. I don't get why people have to take other people's lives. That's something I really want to change. And I guess it's gonna start off with a handshake or a conversation.
Welcome back to North Carolina Under the Gun, our town hall tonight. And joining us in studio is who you just saw there, Jamar Bright. Uh, I understand you've grown about three inches since we saw you last. Uh, thank you so much uh, for being here tonight. Uh, it's been a few months since we caught up with you. Just tell us if you can how you and your family are doing. Right. Um, so far, it's been so it's been good. We still have our moments where we kind of break down, but we get past those, and we try to we try to see what comes next. We focus on brighter things. And we don't want to leave it there because we still have a fight to win. But on other days, we get past it. And a lot of people ask us, how do we do it? Like, it's like we didn't lose anybody in our family because we were so happy all the time. And uh, honestly, I don't know. My mom is very strong. And um, I think you're strong. <laughs> thank you. But, uh, um, our family, together, we're not going to back down from anything. So I just wanted to just say um, we're holding up good. I'm curious, you're 14, right? You're going to be 15 here in a couple weeks? Yes. Early happy birthday, by the way. Thank uh, you. I'm curious your take as a 14-year-old listening to this you know, debate tonight and this discussion in here. What goes through your head? What are you thinking? A lot of things goes through my head. Um, I've been wanting to say something for a while, with all due respect. Um, when they were talking about how kids bring their parents gun to school, it, a lot of stuff, it, a lot of things go through my mind because this is my generation they're speaking on. And um, I want to see, I, I've been seeing how they've been dealing with this debate. And They've been saying how uh, kids take their parents' guns and bring them to school and how it shouldn't be loaded and stuff like that. Uh, those are all good facts, but we need to really focus on the children, their self, the home they're raised in. The parents, are they play a big part in the situation that is going on in the household. Um, there, there could be a dad beating on his son, and the son wanted to take it out on someone other than his dad. So he takes his gun to school and shoots up to school. So it's a lot of stuff that uh, I want to discuss, but I really don't play a part in this. So I'll just leave it right there. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, there's a lot of people that disagree on a lot in this room, but I know everyone agreed. Right before we came on, they said, you know, be strong for your brother. Yeah. And uh, we appreciate you being a part of this. Thank you so much. Uh, you can have a seat. We also want to bring in Debbie Harrison uh, from Carson's Compassion Project. We saw this as well. Tell us about Carson's Compassion Project and how it's going. Um, so like I said in the documentary, um, Carson was my only child, and we were super close. And my whole world was taken from me in a, in a moment. And so I had to spend my energy doing good and focusing on making sure love and light overcame the evil that took Carson from this earth. And so I started Carson's Compassion Project. It's a nonprofit and um, we do some work in York County. Next month we'll be collecting stuffed animals to give to first responders to give to kids in crisis. Um, we did that last year. We got over 3,000 stuffed animals. We're aiming for 5,000 this year. Set your goals high. <laughs> um, and then I have led teams of people to Africa to do work there in Carson's name also, as well as some other things we have going on. But, um, you know, I was at a candlelight vigil last night in York County for um, victim, families of violence victims, murder victims. And what I saw when I was standing in that circle was that we all, we were from all different walks of life and all different age groups, and we were all affected by the same thing. And I don't know what the answer is, but I know that there needs to be some kind of reform. The man that murdered my daughter should have never been allowed to purchase a gun, but he was, and Carson is no longer here. So that whole circle of people last night that was standing there missing their loved one, it's, it's as a result of guns, and I don't disagree that there's education that needs to happen. And I'm not saying take guns away from people. I'm just saying there definitely needs to be reform. Well, thank you so much. Thank I appreciate you. it. Jamar, thank you, uh, both of you, for your strength and being here tonight. Uh, we have uh, several minutes left. And 
Uh, it's been an emotional night. It's been a very passionate night. And so I kind of want to give our panelists a chance to sort of give us their final thoughts on, on, on what they want to see uh, moving forward. Uh, Representative Clark, let's start with you and Raleigh. <coughs> Thank you. I really appreciate being on here tonight and I want to say to Jamara that I really want to hear what you have to say and I hope that you will come visit me in Raleigh or I will come visit you in Mecklenburg County because I want to hear what you are feeling and experiencing with your friends and your family and what you think is happening because you are the future of this country and I want to know what you have to say about what's going on. You know, um, I've been involved in gun violence prevention for a long time. I got involved after the Sandy Hook shooting. Um, I didn't know a lot about gun laws when I started and I have spent a lot of time studying them and studying what's important and what works. Um, and what does work is um, having gun laws that prevent people who are a danger to themselves and others of ha from having access to firearms. That is literally the simplest thing we can do. It's a background checks, it's extreme risk protection orders in whatever form that is. And we need to be open to that and open to passing laws that can do that. It can, if we can save one life, we're doing good. And I hope that um, we've had this conversation, we brought awareness to this issue that it goes above and beyond just um, talking points and it goes, it's people, it's about people and I hope we can move forward on this. Um, I'm committed to my um, cause and to doing whatever I can to end gun violence and make steps to keep our community safer. That is something I am dedicated to um, and will continue to be until lives are being saved. Representative Clark, thank you. We only got about two minutes left. Mr. Vallone? Uh, well, first off, I would like to note that North Carolina did, has done something that would prevent um, the, something like Carson's murder. Uh, in 2015, we passed a uh, legislation which requires clerks of superior court to more readily report and immediately report involuntary commitments and other mental incapacities. And in fact, we've gone back and digitized those records through the administrative office of the courts. The difference between North and South in, Carolina. It, correct. That's correct. That was in South Carolina. Now, that said, I, our organization is interested in saving lives by enabling lawful citizens to protect protect themselves with concealed handguns. To that extent, we are interested for one thing in seeing an, uh, some means of allowing faculty members to protect their students from active shooter scenarios, which of course have been a problem elsewhere, not so much in North Carolina, but in other elsewhere, even in places with stringent gun control like New Zealand. So we are interested in protecting children and saving lives. Mr. Vallone, thank you very much. Mr. King, we've got about a minute left in the show. And I'll be very short, but first of all, I want to apologize to you, Debbie that we didn't do more to save your child. South Carolina owed you a lot more and owed the citizens of South Carolina a lot more. The gentleman should have never been able to obtain a gun in South Carolina. Should have never happened. And I will work with you and others to ensure that that never happens again. Sheriff, briefly. I think that we, this was a very good discussion. I think it was a very educational discussion, and I think we need more of that. We need both sides not to stay on the other side of the tracks. I think these gentlemen and these ladies and these young men and the owners of shops and myself are just the beginning, and I think if we have these conversations, we, we can come to some common ground. Education, conflict resolution, and gun safety will help us. All this background check and all this stuff, that's not gonna work. Sir, thank you so much. Thank you all for a passionate yet respectful discussion. I know there's a lot of issues we wanted to get to. We could do this for hours and hours and days and days, and hopefully we can all do it again in the future. Thank you so much. And thank all of you for watching at home, North Carolina Under the Gun. Have a great night.